Can you do number eight?
When Artaxerxes gives to Ezra things for worship, he gave unto him 100 talents of silver. That's verse 22. 100 gnaws of wheat, 100 baits of wine, 100 baits of oil, and sold without a prescribed measure. He gives Ezra salt without prescribing how much salt it ought to be. You'll need to understand the order of worship and how salt in the temple symbolizes the grace of the Lord. And how salt is used in every offering that is to be given. Now, when it comes to our lives, you would note that God measures almost everything. The bread that we receive give us this day our daily bread. It is measured. When it talks about suffering, the vinegar that we receive in terms of suffering, it is measured. But there is one that is not measured that we receive. It is the salt of grace. For we cannot have more than enough grace. God gives it to us in abundance. We can measure sweetness of sugar and we can lock it up, especially when you have children in the house. You lock it up and you give them periodically. But when it comes to salt, it is always available for all. And that is how God approaches when he comes with grace to us. It ought to be accessible for all because his grace as salt ought to preserve our souls. My prayer is that as we get into worship today, we might say, Lord, give us the abundance of salt that we might be preserved in you Give us the abundance of the salt of grace without measure. We shall bow our heads as we pray. Merciful Father, who is gracious unto us, your children, we are here at your own invitation. Come unto me, all ye that labor, and I have a learden, and I will give you rest. We pray, Heavenly Father, with the burdens that we have accumulated over the year 2022, allow us, Heavenly Father, to cast them at your feet. In the storms of our lives, we are thankful that there is a Messiah who has stood in the year 2022 and said, Peace be still. And we found ourselves having this calm even in the midst of the storms. Now as we come to the end of this year, Heavenly Father, our prayer for 2023 is that give us salt without measure. Do not limit your grace to us, but may we, Heavenly Father, 
bask in your glory even in the midst of darkness. Allow us to sing along with David and say, Yea, though we walk through the valleys of the shadows of death, yet we fear no evil. For your rod and your staff, they comfort us. We are getting into worship now where you are going to be speaking to us. May you lead us besides the still waters. May you, Heavenly Father, provide pasture for us, bread sufficient for us to carry back home. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you speak to us as though you are speaking for the last time. Hear our hearts, take them, clean them, and make us as white as snow. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Greet Church of uh, God and Savior uh, Jesus Christ again. Uh, maybe may the church be saved in the time. We're going to consider the book of Malachi chapter 1. Malachi chapter 1, verses 6. It reads, A son honors his father, and a servant his master. If I am a father, where is my honor due to me? If I am a master, where is the respect due to me? Says the Lord Almighty. It is you, O priests, who despise my name. But you ask how we despise your name. The book of Malachi was written in the time when the children of Israel, including their priests and the leaders, were taking things as common things. They were taking worship as if it is a common thing. And when you look and you start the book of Malachi, you are going to realize that everything to them was as simple as, as, as normal as if they are worshiping a human being. And in that moment, they are going to realize that even the, 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 the sacrifices, even the gifts, even the, the, the offerings that were due to God, they even took them for granted. Then God asked them, where is the honor that is due to me? Listen, I have visited a lot of kings where I come from. You, you don't walk into a king's homestead with empty hands. Yeah. Some of them, they, they even demand a, a brand. Some of them, they even demand a, a whisk. But I am so surprised that when you visit a king who was created by the king of kings, you go there with groceries. But when you come to the house of God, you come with your hands empty. Yeah. There are other people that regret thereafter. When you go to the book of Matthew, you are going to realize that there is Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. They came late with their gifts when Christ was dead. Yet Mary Magdalene and Simon, the leper, they had already given Christ the gift. Don't be late to come with the offering to God. Do not be late to offer to the God that has created you. are going to go around. We are going to pray for the offering. Okay. 
which is penned by his daughter. Spafford then had kids after the death of his children. And the daughter, when Spafford was lying at his deathbed and about to die, she then pens the last stanza of this song. Okay. And she says, And Lord, haste the day when, thy, when our faith shall be made sight.
Genu, ma ina 
when we arrived here, we had one goal in mind, that is to answer the question, who are these? Um, we began by trying to allude to the God that they worship. In that we said, these that have come out of tribulation worshipped God, even though circumstances were not favorable. They worshipped God even when circumstances were favorable. Because God is God and God will never change. And God will not succumb to the desires of men, but he will act as he sees fit because he knows the plans that he has for men. In our attempt to answer, who are these? We said these are they that followed Christ. And for them to be able to follow Christ, they needed the mind of Christ. So they adopted the mind of Christ and understood that this Christ that which his mind they are adopting humbled himself and emptied himself of divinity. Humbled himself even to the point of death and death at the cross. We took an off ramp a bit and we desired to know what Christ requires of us. And in his response to Jarius, when he is told that your daughter is sick, he says, only believe. Don't be afraid. Just believe. And in our attempt to answer who are these, then we came to the servant who woke up very early to go and check if everything is ready for his master, Elisha. And upon waking up, he discovers that the city is surrounded by armies of the Armenians. Then he runs back to the prophet and he says, Prophet, we are in trouble. But the prophet was not bothered by anything because he knew in whom he believed in. And instead of being afraid like the servant, he prayed to God that God opens the eyes of the servant. So we discovered that these who have come out of great tribulation had their eyes fixed on what is eternal and forgot about what is temporal. And whilst they perceived what is eternal, they realized the glory and the beauty of God. To such an extent, they came to a point whereby they asked themselves a question. What is man that God is so mindful of them? When God showed them what they could become, when God gave them a dream of where they could reach, they asked themselves a question. What were we that God should put us and make us a little bit lower than angels? And whilst they perceived all of that, Christ showed them a city of permanent refuge. John saw them at the city. But to those who have not yet reached the city, to those who are waiting for that vision to become true, they then get to wait with us. And to us who are waiting, what Christ was simply saying to us was remain in the city. Because your adversary, the devil, is roaming like a lion, seeking the one whom he may devour. David, as he mourns the death of Abner, he says, Oh, Abner, you died as a fool. So to any man who leaves the city of refuge, he will die as a fool. Because the angel that was cast down from heaven is roaming, pretending to be a lion, seeking him whom he will devour. There's a song that I want to sing. Yeah. We can't be in PE and not uh, sing a traditional Kosa hymn. Um, do not worry, I'm about to conclude. Do not worry. Lisa Lee, she Galaku Tukungu Siyen 
opportunity to stand before your children in representation of heaven. How I pray, dear God, may you allow me to decrease as you increase. How I pray, dear God, that you lead me through the unction of the Holy Spirit. May the end of the day, Heavenly Father, may the, may the message be relevant to us all. That at the end of the day, Heavenly Father, we may be able to find our spot in heaven. That none of us should have a mansion being left unoccupied in heaven. When all is said and done, we thank you, dear God. Walk with us during this message. In Jesus' name I do pray. Amen. The book of Acts chapter 27. The book of Acts chapter 27. We are going to read verses 30 and verse 32. The book of Acts. It's book number five in the New Testament. Just after the book of John. Before the book of Romans. If you find yourself in Corinthians, you are lost. I 
Are we all there? Acts chapter 27. We are reading verses 30, 31, and 32. I spell here pages. Acts chapter 27. Verses 30, 31, and 32. Are we all there? It reads as follows. And as the sailors were seeking to escape from the ship, when they had let down the skiff into the sea, under pretense of putting out anchors from the pro, Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, unless these men stay in the ship, you cannot be saved. Then the soldiers cut away the ropes of the skiff and let it fall. Let's read it again. And the sailors were, spe- were seeking to escape from the ship. When they had let down the skiff into the sea, under pretense of putting out anchors from the prone, Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, unless these men stay in the ship, you cannot be saved. Then the soldiers cut away the ropes of the skiff and let it fall off. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, theologians and philosophical people or philosophical scholars then get to have a common argument between the two of them. Bear with me, I'm about to close. The argument between the philosophers and the theologians has to do with a deity, to say who is God. Now, the problem that makes philosophers and theologians to fail to come together is the issue of faith and reason. In that philosophers believe in reason. Now, what is reason? Reason is the faculty of mind through which we can logically come to a rational conclusion. So basically, the philosophers were simply saying that if there is no factual point to prove that God is present, then there is no God. Therefore, the the philosophical scholars would then argue to say that even the Bible that which we believe in is just a book of stories because there is no evidence that support the Bible and the stories of the God whom is written about in the Bible. Even though the theologians would bring archaeological arguments to show them that there once was a particular boat after a particular time that was created by Noah to make sure that the earth, when it is cleansed, eight people should be saved. The philosophical arguments, the philosophical scholars would still remain to say, still, you can't show us who is God. But one thing the philosophical scholars did not understand is the second commandment. The second commandment of the Ten Commandments then says, you shall not have any other foreign idols or any graven image that which you worship. Now, God was simply saying in his writing to the children of Israel, If you have an image of who I am, then I cease to be God. The reason is the angels in heaven, as they get to worship on a day-to-day basis, they then get to scream, holy, 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 which seems to mean that every time they open their eyes, they see a different God. Then they close their eyes and open again. They see another version of God. And this happens every second of every moment as they they worship in heaven. So God was simply saying that if in your mind you have an image of who I am, you have then compartmentalized me into a box that makes me to be a person who is finite. Meaning that I cannot be what you have placed me to be in your mind. So the philosophers wanted an image of God to prove that God is God. But God then says to them, I cannot be understood by men, but I give to men the little that I can give to them that they may be able to understand. 
That is why God then operates in function more than in presence where we can see him through the physical eye. Because God understood we need his function more than we need to see him. And he says to Moses, if you see me, you will die. Then the scholars continue to look for reasons, factual reasons, to prove the existence of God. But then the, the theologians, as they bring about a definition, they say faith, like Pastor Stuller alluded the other day, is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things unseen. So when they describe faith, they say faith is the belief in the truth of something that does not require any evidence and may not be provable by any empirical or rational means. So basically they were simply saying that the faith that an individual has does not need a particular evidence for the person to have that faith. So in other words, they simply said that if there is evidence, the theologians are arguing, they said if there is evidence, then faith ceases to be. Because when there is evidence, there is no need for faith. That is why the scholar of Hebrews then says, in as long as Christ has not come, we will continue living by faith. Because Christ is the author and Christ is the finisher of our faith. So when our faith then gets to become sight, that is only at that particular time where we'll cease to have faith. The reason being it is because that which we were hoping to see, we have seen. Now, understanding these arguments between faith and reason, it is a common dilemma to us who are living in this day and age. The reason being it is because even in our day-to-day -day dealings, we require facts for us to be able to move forward. But faith does not require evidence for us to move forward. However, God understood that men would require facts for them to be able to move forward. And in that, he created the heavens and the earth before he created men. So that men, as they arrive, they can say, because of this animal that I see in the Garden of Eden, God is present. And then you find the story that which we are at. I understood the sailors. The text says that the sailors were seeking to escape and they lowered the boat under pretense as if they are lowering the anchors. Now, before you arrive to this particular place, you get to understand that in this story, they were moving Paul from where he was to go to Rome. And as they were moving Paul from Jerusalem to Rome, you get to understand that Paul had a mission and the mission that Paul had was not given to Paul, but it was given to God. To such an extent that when he, Paul, was in a boat, he then traveled with them to a particular island. And then they shifted from one boat into the other. And as they entered into the other boat, Paul then says to them before they begin the journey, it is not safe for us to be traveling right now because winter is ahead of us. Now, when you get to understand the dynamics of nature, when it is winter, it is the, it is the most dangerous time to be in the sea, to be in the river, to be in the lakes. Because understanding geography and all these particular things, they say that during winter, then the water temperature begins to rise and the water levels begin to rise. That is why even in the evening, they bring us out of the sea. Why? Because it becomes even more dangerous. So there is something about winter, there is something about the night that makes nature to become dangerous. Then Paul says, it is safer for us to remain here than for us to travel to Rome now. But the sailors were not understanding the point in which Paul was bringing. Because to the sailors, they knew how to maneuver themselves around the winter. And then it happens that as they entered into the boat, the Bible says the wind started to blow softly. And as the wind was blowing softly, they didn't anticipate the fact that the storm is about to come. They didn't know that the storm was upon them. They kept on moving, they kept on moving until they found themselves in the middle of the storm. And then when they were in the middle of the storm, the Bible records to say that they started to wrestle with the wind. 
to a point whereby they lost all confidence in what they could do. And as they lost all confidence in what they could do, they then go to Paul and say, Paul, what should we do? Now, Paul is just a theologian. Aside from him being a theologian, he's just a tent maker. And he has no expertise that have to do with riding or sailing in a boat. In actual fact, when he enters a boat, he's just a passenger. Therefore, he can't do anything to assist them. But then Paul then says to them, I warn you to not enter into the boat, to not enter into the sea, because the storm is against us. And then when Paul then speaks to them, he says to Julius the centurion, do not worry if anyone stays in the boat, they will not die. But they kept on moving and kept on moving. The Bible records to say at a point whereby they saw themselves close to the seashore, the sailors then anticipated that there is probably rocks between where we are and the seashore. Therefore, what is left of the boat will then be destroyed by the rocks. And the sailors, as they saw this particular thing, the sailors then decided to give up. And as they decided to give up, they said, let us lower a small boat. And as they lowered a small boat, their plan was to escape the boat and leave those in the boat. Now, it was very reckless of the captain of the ship because every mandate of every captain of the ship, it is to make sure that those who are passengers in the boat make it to the other side. Muruti Muswang preaches about uh, 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 the disciples crossing over. And it is the captain who says, let us cross over. And then the captain knew that there was no other way but for them to make it to the other side. And then they meet the storms of life along the way. They wake the captain up to say, do you not care that we perish? But the captain says, I have assured you we will make it to the other side. But the captain who is transporting Paul from Crete to Rome then says to them, let us run away. Now the Bible says they had 275 passengers, including Paul. And in these 275 passengers, including Paul, they wanted to leave them because the rest who were remaining in the boat were going to be the sail, were going to be the centurion and his army. And it was also going to be the prisoners of Rome. And as Luke records this, he says, Paul then is told by an angel what is going to happen if anyone leaves the boat. Mind you, at that particular time, the boat has been beaten and battered by the storm. The boat is, no shape, is in no shape to travel in the sea. The Bible records to say the water was coming into the boat, but the boat kept on moving. Because as they saw these things happening, all in their mind that they had was that they were going to drown. But the Bible is clear to say that only Paul was not concerned about his fate. The reason is because Ellen White, as he writes, he says, Paul was told by God that you will not die until you minister in Rome. So for Paul to him to die in the sea, it was not a possibility because he knew that God is a God who is faithful and it is a God who is able to then uh, uh, fulfill his promises. And at the point whereby he understands that the boat is about to sink, he smiles. The reason is he knew that at the end of it all, I must minister to Caesar. Now, Ellen White says it was the faith of Paul that kept the boat moving because they understood that if Paul then dies, then the mission of God does not become as it's supposed to be. But Paul understood that the angel even appeared when he was on the boat to say, do not worry. The seashore is guaranteed. But now Paul then says, then Paul says to the, 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 to, the, to the centurion, says, Julius, those men are trying to escape. If they enter into the boat, they will lose their life. But if they remain in the boat, they will preserve their lives. Now, I've come to say to you, the sailors were right. The sailors were very right. Because according to their rational and empirical studies, they knew that there was no way this boat was going to make it to the seashore. You did not get it. The sailors were right. Why? 
because they knew, according to their rationale and empirical knowledge, the boat was not able to make it to the other side. So they were operating under the assumption of reason to say, according to the facts of this boat, there is no way we are all going to survive. But if we make it into the smaller boat, we as sailors will survive. So the sailors were right. They were right. Evidence proved to them that they were right. They had all information that said to them, flee, jump ship, and leave these people to die. After all, these are just soldiers and criminals. The Bible says at one point, when the soldiers saw that the boat was too messed up, they said to Julius, according to the laws of Rome, if a prisoner is on the run and we can't catch him, we are able to kill the prisoner and then bring a report to Rome to say we have killed the prisoner because the prisoner was on the run. So the soldiers then say to Julius, let us kill all these prisoners and save ourselves, since well we could swim. <laughs> the Bible says, every soldier, even in today's uh, uh, armies, the Navy people, there's no one in the Navy who does not have the ability to swim. You can't be in the Navy and not be able to swim. So all the centurions of Rome and their men had the ability to swim. And they said, we could swim to the seashore. But these ones, they can't swim. And if there are some who can swim here, they might run away. And if they run away and we cannot account for them, then we will be killed when we get to Rome. So let us kill them now and flee for our lives. I am quite certain that Rome will not say anything about us. Then Julia says, we can't because Paul is the reason why the ship is still moving. He says, had we listened to the counsel of the apostle, we wouldn't be in the calamity that we find ourselves in. But faith, when we get to understand it, is not dependent on reason. You see, faith does not need facts for it to exist. Faith exists because it must prove that they are faiths. In other words, we are simply saying that we have faith so that we may be able to prove something. And that's something which we want to prove is the presence of God. That is why when, when, when they speak about faith, like Pastor Gumen alluded, the hypostasis, faith is a substance, but the foundation is God. We can't see him. We don't know him, but we are riding on him. If we see him, he ceases to be God. Therefore, he changes in function. Sometimes he puts us in the sea. Sometimes he elevates us to the sky. Because he knows what we need at any given moment. And the most important thing about faith, uh, the, the writer of Hebrews says, it is important because without it, it is difficult to impress God. If the roof does not believe that there is a foundation, the roof will fall. But if the roof believes there is a foundation, the roof will stand. Ah, you didn't get it. If we fail to believe that there is God, we will not make it. But at the belief that there is God, victory is sure. The end of the road is sure. The race is sure. So Paul and his faith determined the salvation of the 275. It took the faith of one man in the, in the ship to preserve 275 men who were in the ship. How many of us here have faith? If it can take one man to preserve the lives of those who are around him, how many can we preserve if we all had faith? The question is, are those around you able to survive because of your faith? Yeah. 
Paul says to Timothy, Timothy, I've run the race. I fought a good fight. And I've kept the faith. The Greek word he uses there for faith is piston. Now, if you have done or studied mechanics, or you have studied how to fix engines, like your elder David over there, a piston is a part of an engine that moves up and down in a cylinder. The reason why it moves up and down is to propel a vehicle by pushing fuel in the air. Basically, what we are simply saying that a piston is responsible for the combustion of fuel. The piston is responsible for the burning of fuel. Now, without a piston, a car cannot move. Because if a piston is not present, there is nothing to burn the, to burn the oil. And if there is nothing to burn the fuel, then the car cannot move. You may pour petrol, you may pump up all the tires, you may clean the car, you may make sure that oil is everything. But if there is no piston to pump up and down in the cylinder, then it becomes difficult for the vehicle to move. Then Paul says, like a piston, my faith combusted the fuel in my heart to make it possible that I should move forward. Because without my faith, there is nothing that is pumping inside my heart that makes me believe that I'll move forward. Paul says, uh, Ellen White says, when Paul saw the shipwreck, he knew in his heart that this is not my final destination. I must still see Caesar. I must still see Nero and preach to him. Because God had promised that he would preach to Nero. Many of us here come to church and we know the end goal of life. We know that Christ is coming soon. We know that the just must live by faith. And we know that at any moment, of na- any, moment of, any moment from now, we must be part or we must be said to be these who have come out of great tribulation. But the absence of faith to propel you to move forward makes it difficult for you to be a candidate of those who shall be part of these who have come out of great tribulation. It is the faith that we have that pulls us out of great tribulation. Because it combusts fuel on a day-to-day basis to help us to move forward. You see, God is, 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 is such an amazing God. Even if one of us here has faith, he may be able to save all of us. He doesn't need all of you to have faith. He just needs one. And those surrounding the one with faith will be beneficiaries to the faith. That is why David says he prepares a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Do you understand something about the enemies? As he says, my cup runneth over. The enemies sitting in the table are beneficial of the wife, beneficiaries of the wine that Christ continues to pour inside the glass. So even if you have enemies, for the fact that you have faith, they qualify for salvation. The people who were in the boat with Paul were his enemies. They were there to arrest him. But they did not know that they were protecting the plan of salvation. They did not know that they were pushing the gospel. Because as they were protecting Paul from being killed by the other soldiers, as they were protecting Paul from dying in the ocean, it was the plan of salvation. It was grace that employed them. Some of your enemies are employed by God. To protect you from the evil one. Now, Paul says, we may have many facts, many reasons to leave the church. There are many things that, that, that are evidence to us to say, because of one, two, three, I will leave. There are many things that which we, 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 we have felt, many things that which we have experienced, many things that have been done to us. But Paul says, if you enter into that boat, You will not survive. So many of us had many reasons why we want to leave the church. It is it is nothing common. Many of the young people that wish we grew up with have left the church. And some of you see them living life nicely and thinking that if I also leave the church, I'll also live that life. But the truth of the matter is that there's no salvation out there. Salvation is only in here. 
These who have come out of great tribulation, they remained in the ship. The ship was bruised. The ship was battered. The rocks had finished everything in the sea, but they still remained in the boat. Because the boat was making it to the seashore. The captain says, let us cross over. The captain is Christ. He knew that it is winter. He knew that in winter it is difficult to sail. But he says to us, remain in this boat. Remain in this boat. For one thing is certain, we will cross over. We will cross over. Many are the reasons, Bazalwan, that propel us to leave the church. See, Satan is very cunning. He will show you a good life outside, but he doesn't show you the detrimental part of that good life outside. Many are the reasons why we want to leave this church. We are not treated well. Yes, in the hospital, no one is here to treat you well. They put injections on you. They put drips on you. Nothing is nice in the hospital. But the only reason why you live in the hospital healed it is because they did their job. It's not nice. 40 days, 40 nights Noah spent with animals. It was not nice. But the guarantee that he had was that salvation was assured. Paul says, I've kept the faith. Are you keeping the faith? Is the faith keeping you? Because faith is supposed to move. Faith is not a stagnant thing. Yeah, you see, uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in the Greek understanding, anything in feminine is productive. Right? Yeah. Because feminine things produce children, they produce everything. Okay? They produce the next generation. We just plant the seed and they produce. Then the word faith is productive. Any faith that is stagnant is not faith. That is why. That is why James say, now faith without works is dead. Because faith must move you. Faith must keep you on the move. There is no stagnant faith that we can have in this world. And my Bible says, all these, <laughs> even Paul is included, all these died having the faith. They kept the faith. They remained in the ship. Even though the ship was bruised and battered, they remained in the ship. And they died. They died. But the true understanding is that they did not die, they rested. Because one day, the Lord will come. And their faith shall be brought to sight. And when their faith is brought to sight, this author of faith will finish the faith. Number 20 says, Umsindisi, Mkalisi, Walolo Luham. So Pega is in your way. Where are you looking? Where are you going? If you leave the boat, 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 you will die like Abner and die as a fool. Songwriter says, Ngena ungalibani, kukonis in peace. Into the fold now straying, there is rest and room. I've never made an appeal this whole camp, but allow me to make one. We are crossing over to a new year. And your desire, your desire is to just remain in the ship. Come hell or high water. Your desire is to just remain in the ship. So many other reasons that can make us leave this ship. But your desire is that you should remain in the ship. 
So many sermons have been preached and so many illustrations have been made. We have tried to show you who are these, but the reality of it all is for you to make it to these are they. You ought to remain in the sheep. Yes, a lot of people have a problem with the Adventist church, but God says remain in the sheep. You are there and your desire is to remain in the sheep. Your desire is to hold on tight, to, 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 to cleave to God, to cleave to Christ in the hope that at his coming, we shall be part of those who will be called up into the sky. You are there and you are saying, yes, I've had many reasons, but I want to look beyond my reason because reason is not dependent on faith and faith is an independent variable. It doesn't depend on reason to exist. You are simply saying, I want my faith in God to combust fuel in my life that I may be able to move forward, especially through the trials and tribulations we face in and outside the ship. You are there and you are saying, I want to remain. I want to keep the faith. Let us rise as we pray. If you are there. I'm going to ask Pastor Mabena to come and pray. But in his approach to come and pray, there's someone who has a special prayer that they want to utter. They don't want to tell us what is the prayer. They are struggling to utter the prayer or the words for that prayer in their hearts. And they're hoping that Christ can still remain uh, receiving that prayer. There are people who have special needs who have special needs that they have and they want us to pray for them. We are going to pray. If you are there and you have a special need that which you want us to mention to God, you may not know, we may not know what the special need is, but you want us to make mention that God should visit us in our special problems. If you are there, I'll invite you to come up front I'll invite you to come up front so that we may be able to finish this service in prayer. You are there and you have a special prayer that you want us to utter. You want, you, you want us to put you in a special position where God will answer your prayers. We have things that you can't tell the pastors. We have things you can't tell people at home but you want God to pay attention to these things. You are there. Just come up front. There's a lot of space in front. Come up front. We are going to pray. We are going to pray. This is, this is the last chance. We are not going to close anyone out. This is the last chance. Are you there? Are you there? Do you have a problem, a challenge that you want us to pray for? Come up front. Come up front. You might not get this appeal anymore in 2022. You may not get it in 2023. If you are still there and you are dilly dallying between coming and go and remaining there, this is the chance. This is the time. Come up front. Pastor Mapena, you may lead us in prayer. Father, some parliament is ready, and I think we have been upon a sick or something. When the Lamas is old, no, I'm going to cool the shaman pigeons in a safe and salary because it's one case for my own amen. You may make the way now, what you want to want to want to want to want burdens are lifted at Calvary. Yes, As we are here, Heavenly Father's declare. Zonki to possess to who is now in his 
Simili elako ichoko. Jogo chandegayo na pesina manye bakona sipu gile sinjalo. Sipo pe usi tobe nge sanda sapu esno musa. Abantu abako mawe paga maka anje. Aba paga mingo baba zenzisa. Ba paga mingo baba sazi. Kubana ase kona amanda eka zini le uwe. Tata impilo zetu msizota degayo. Uzi fiche na pansu impilo zako zotana. Usatano dina zongi nkela. Ukubana askupe. Paga tempo onzweni. He's seeking always. That we might exit this ship. But you are the captain of the ship. And as the captain of the ship. Knowing that you are in the ship, we refuse to leave this boat. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you keep us under the wings of your love. We have these who have taken this walk up front to you. They have prayers within their hearts. You fully know them. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you meet them at their points of view. Some of them are health issues. Some of them are financial issues. Some of them have to deal with their education. Whatever the challenges, Heavenly Father, we pray that as we close this year, as they leave going back home, they might say, there is a God in Israel who is still able that you answer on their behalf. Pray, Heavenly Father, that of all the blessings that we have been given, while you might permit the devil to come and attack, do not allow him to take us away from you. Yes, sir. This is our prayer. In Jesus' name.
Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly, above all we can ever think or imagine.